Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The federal government is scrutinizing the H-1B visa program. Apple and the FBI continue to duke it out. And Susan Walters is my guest. The H-1B visa program, the program designed to place highly skilled foreign workers in high demand jobs in the U.S. came under fire last week when a teary-eyed former Disney IT worker testified before Congress that Disney required him and about two dozen other IT workers to train foreign-born H-1B workers who then replaced them. Leo Pereiro testified before the Senate Subcommittee on Immigration and the National Interest on Thursday that the foreign-born workers were actually less qualified than he and his colleagues were although he didn't indicate during the testimony which criteria he was using to compare the two skill sets. He said he was called into a meeting and, along with hundreds of other IT workers like himself, told that the foreign-born workers would be replacing them and that they were required to train the newly trained, newly arrived H-1B workers or lose their severance. I was completely silent during this meeting thinking how, I was going to, how this was going to affect my coworkers. How was I going to break news to my family and pay all of our expenses? I would soon be living on unemployment. Later that same day, I clearly remember going to the local church, Pumpkin Sale, and having to tell the kids I couldn't buy any that year because of my job, but being turned over to a foreign worker. Pereiro and others are suing Disney and seeking class action status in federal court, and the Department of Labor is also investigating Disney released a statement on Monday saying, quote, these lawsuits are based on an unsustainable legal theory and are a wholesale misrepresentation of the facts, end quote. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump said he would crack down on H-1B abuses. Apple and the FBI are still going at it about the agency's attempt to get Apple to unlock an iPhone belonging to one of the San Bernardino shooters. The case is seen to have major implications for how much authority the federal government will have to obtain private phone data. This was a week of wins for Apple, beginning on Monday in New York, last Monday, where a federal magistrate judge ruled that the FBI is not entitled to have access to the data of a suspect in a Brooklyn drug case. This was the exact opposite conclusion that the federal magistrate judge in California reached in the San Bernardino case. Judge James Orenstein ruled that the FBI is not entitled to unfettered access to the phone data of the Brooklyn suspect and that Congress has not passed legislation to the contrary. He noted the issue goes beyond individual privacy to the right of businesses such as Apple to engage in commerce without government intrusion. Both Apple and the FBI have taken the matter to Congress, with Apple General Counsel Bruce Sewell testifying before the House Judiciary Committee that allowing the federal government backdoor access to iPhones would open the door for hackers and cyber criminals to exploit what would essentially be a system vulnerability. Sewell also argued that the intrusion the FBI has requested violates free speech because code is a form of speech the Supreme Court recognizes, and the FBI, by asking for a built-in vulnerability, trying to tell Apple how to write its own code. Apple also argues the order violates the Fifth Amendment protection against coercion. But law enforcement officials disagree. Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance also testified, saying the Fourth Amendment is Americans' most powerful protection against government intrusion, not encryption technology. 
Currently, Apple can't even access data on its own phones. So Vance also called for user keys that would enable law enforcement to decode encryption technology whenever necessary. FBI Director James Cummey said Apple and other tech companies are looking to create, quote, warrant-proof spaces in our lives, end quote. During the hearing, Wisconsin Republican Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, author of the USA Freedom Act, told Sewell that Sewell wouldn't like the result if Congress weighed in. One GOP lawmaker, David Jolly from Florida, introduced a bill to prevent the federal government from buying Apple products until Apple agrees to comply with the FBI. Apple's allies include almost all Silicon Valley giants, such as Twitter, Airbnb, LinkedIn, Cloudflare, Kickstarter, Medium, Meetup, Square, and Reddit, all of which filed a joint amicus brief in the Central District of California. United Nations Human Rights Chief Zaid Rad Al-Hussein has also weighed in to support Apple's position, saying the backdoor the FBI is asking for would potentially be a, quote, gift to authoritarian regimes as well as criminal hackers, end quote. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia has blocked the FCC's cap on prison phone rates, the rate inmates' families are charged to speak to incarcerated loved ones, which the commission had set to 11 cents per minute, down from what in some cases the FCC reports was $14 per minute. FCC Republican Commissioner Ajit Pai applauded the Court of Appeals decision, saying the caps were passed for political reasons rather than following the letter of the law. In the wake of the European Court of Justice's invalidation of the Safe Harbor Agreement that for 15 years governed data transfers between the U.S. and the EU, the two world powers have released the details of the data transfer agreement they entered into in late February called the EU-U.S. Privacy Shield. It strengthens the protection of European citizens' data entering the U.S. Google also announced last week that when Europeans ask for search results to be removed in accordance with their right to be forgotten, Google will now remove it from all of their servers around the world. Previously, the data could only be removed from Google servers within local European countries. The Pentagon has a new innovation advisory board. It will be led by Alphabet Chairman and Google CEO Emeritus Eric Schmidt. Senate Republicans have released a 30-page report concluding the White House improperly influenced the FCC as the agency developed last year's net neutrality rules. The FCC is considered an independent agency, which means it's not a cabinet-level position. But the president still appoints commissioners, and there is nothing stopping the president from weighing in on policy matters. However, the Senate report noted that the FCC actually stopped the presses on the drafting of its net neutrality rules and changed its position after President Obama announced that he supported reclassifying broadband under Title II. The report states that this sudden shift violated the Administrative Procedure Act requirement to provide the public with proper notice. The report is available on the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs website. FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel's renomination is on hold, but Senate Commerce Committee Chairman John Thune is being cagey about which member has put a hold on the renomination. However, Thune told FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler at an FCC oversight hearing on Wednesday that if Wheeler were to promise to resign from the FCC's chairmanship in January, it might move along Rosenworcel's nomination. Wheeler's term isn't up until 2018, but Wheeler said he wasn't about to make any, quote, ironclad commitments to step down so many months in advance. Yesterday, Thune introduced an FCC reauthorization bill. The FCC has not been reauthorized since 1990. The consumer group Public Knowledge has filed a 30-page FCC complaint against Comcast. The complaint states that Comcast's streaming service, Stream TV, violates the net neutrality rules because it offers video programming without it counting against data caps as other services such as Netflix do. It says the net neutrality rules explicitly prohibit ISPs from treating its own video content differently than others, which is exactly what Stream TV does. But Comcast said in a statement that Stream TV is a so-called zero rating service that does not touch their customers' broadband service and uses only Comcast's cable system. Public knowledge likens that to a, quote, loophole or regulatory shell game. 
Finally, Verizon has settled with the FCC over the company's use of super cookies to secretly track users' online behavior. Verizon will pay a $1.35 million fine. Stay with us. Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. How about The Miracle Morning, the not-so-obvious secret guaranteed way to transform your life before 8 a.m. by Hal Elrod? You can download The Miracle Morning or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is Susan Walters, Senior Vice President of the California Emergency Technology Fund, a nonprofit that focuses on closing the digital divide in California. She was previously the Regional Director of Community Relations for Citibank in Greater Southern California. Prior to Citibank, she operated a small consulting practice and corporate social responsibility. The work focused on building strategic partnerships between nonprofit organizations and corporations, strategic planning, communications, and marketing. She has worked in myriad areas ranging from telecommunications policy, disability access to multimedia projects. Examples of her work include designing a highly successful technology job training program for low-income adults and youth creating a brand strategy for a buy local food campaign and marketing programs to reach emerging markets. Her firm's clients included AOL, Verizon, Microsoft, Independent Television Service, San Francisco Giants, Freddie Mac Foundation, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and the Food Roots Network. Susan has held senior positions in communications and marketing with Adwala and Pacific Bell. Prior to her work in the private sector, Susan served as a senior staff member to Willie L. Brown Jr. during his tenure as Speaker of the California Assembly. She is an alumna of the Coral Fellows Program and received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California at Berkeley and a Master of Public Policy degree from Claremont University. She serves on the board of directors for CD Tech, Bay Area Video Coalition, World Institute on Disability, and the Center for Accessible Technology. Please welcome Susan Walters. Susan, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So we're going to turn our attention today to home broadband adoption. It's something most people listening to this podcast probably take for granted. I know I do. I have it. I pay for it. And when I come home, I expect it to work and not just to use on my laptop. We often hear about the Internet of Things and all of these devices that are connected to the Internet, that use the Internet, but aren't your typical desktop or laptop computers. Things like smart thermostats, smart TVs, home security systems. These are all things that can't be used without Internet access. But most importantly for folks is just having the simple ability to complete homework assignments or look up information online for a research paper or participate in telehealth services and applications. But what happens if you don't have broadband at home? A new Pew Research study shows home broadband adoption has actually plateaued. It's down three percentage points from 70 to 67 percent. And we're still seeing those disparities mostly reflected along the lines of race, class and age. There are many factors for this. And Susan Walters is here to help shed some light on this important issue. So, Susan, thanks again for joining me. Can you tell us a little bit more about your organization, Internet for All Now, and a little bit about the need the organization was created to address? Internet for All Now is a project of the California Emerging Technology Fund, and we were chartered by the California Public Utilities Commission in 2006 to close the digital divide in California, and we were created as the result of telecom mergers in California, and there was $60 million set aside as part of the public benefit from the mergers to set up this foundation, and we are an independent nonprofit foundation that focuses on closing the digital divide in California. And as we have been working on this through the years, it became very clear that we needed to focus on the federal level. When we started, we did not have that intention. And so currently, the Federal Communications Commission is considering 
a very key issue, the Lifeline program, and integrating broadband at home into that program. Currently, you probably realize there is a Lifeline for telephone service. It started in 1985, surprising to some at the direction of President Reagan. And a few years ago, cell phones were added to the Lifeline program. So we, of course, think broadband should have been there quite a while ago, but we're thrilled that the FCC is considering that now. We know that, just like you were referring to, so many low-income households do not have broadband at home. So when you look at uh, Latino populations, for instance, and this is a majority of Spanish-speaking Latinos, but also includes some English-speaking Latino households, 41% of them uh, don't have internet at home. When you look at people with disabilities, when you look at seniors, uh, the numbers are in, you know, the 40% and uh, low 50% tiles. So this is very important to keep people connected to really almost our democracy when you look at it, but certainly the day-to-day functional aspects of life. So what, when's the last time you registered your car? You probably did it online, right? But if you don't have broadband at home, that means you may be taking off a day to go down to the DMV or take a bus to the DMV. It just is a much longer process. It's just one example where broadband at home can be more convenient. Yeah, the DMV is definitely not the place to be. Let's, exactly. let's let's shift to universal service, particularly Lifeline. And we've discussed Lifeline on this show before with Nicole Turner Lee on episode fourteen and Michael Scarado on episode twelve. But give us a refresher, Susan, for those who don't know, what is Lifeline and what is your organization's unique perspective when it comes to Lifeline? Sure. So Lifeline is part of the Universal Service Fund. The Universal Service Fund is funded by a surcharge on our telephone bills, and this is nationally. And so what happens is the two or two cents or 10 cents from everybody's telephone bill gets aggregated into the Universal Service Fund. And the Universal Service Fund was set up to make sure that households with low income people in rural areas where it costs companies more to put the infrastructure in, have a subsidy so that they have access to the telephone network so that we are all better off if everyone is connected. We have more of a level playing field or equal access. But we know with our evolving network, it's no longer so much a focus on telephone service. Most people communicate now through the internet. People have been letting go of telephone lines, right, and using a cell phone or using the internet to communicate much like we are on Skype. So aside from the importance of Lifeline and its application to broadband as well as traditional phone service, um, you know, we already have it applying to wireless broadband, but we still need to get it for wireline. Aside from that issue and the importance of it, what about the way Lifeline works in practice? Have you heard any criticisms about the way Lifeline works and the way it's administered by the FCC? There have been issues uh, with Lifeline in how it has worked, especially for wireless service. And the FCC a number of years ago included wireless service and the number of subscribers ballooned. And they offered, they set a policy that to offer it free, but we know nothing's really free. So there have been a couple things that have happened. One is the providers, the cell phone companies offering service through the Lifeline program, a number of which are a good number of which are resellers of like an AT&T or Verizon or, you know, some of the larger companies, they're small resellers, will offer the cell phone free and offer a certain number of minutes free. Some even do unlimited minutes of voice free, but then you have to pay for data. 
right? Or if they have a limited number of voiced minutes, then they charge a high price for minutes once you go over. So the phone doesn't really end up being free. And some consumers then, once if they have a limit on the number of minutes, they will disconnect from one service and then, you know, connect to another service. So there were some changes made to the program in 2012 because the other problem with the program is the providers, both on the telephone side and the cell phone side, were not always timely in informing the FCC administrator for the Lifeline program of when somebody would disconnect so they would continue to collect the subsidy that's provided for the services, which, by the way, is $9.25, regardless of telephone service, wireless service. And the FCC is currently considering the same surcharge for broadband. They're also considering only one subsidy per household. And that's one of the areas where the advocacy initiative of the California Emerging Technology Fund is saying, this doesn't make sense. These are households that have lots of challenges that need lifeline service. And we're talking a large percentage of seniors. You know, if they still have a a landline, they're not going to really want to give it up. And cell phone bills can be very high. Why would somebody want to give it up to move to something else? So we're recommending that the FCC use do two subsidies per household, one for phone service, whatever that the consumer thinks is best for them, and then one for fixed broadband service, so broadband at home, so that we can make sure that households with low incomes continue to benefit from all the things that are available through broadband, from basic services, as in government programs, You can't get a GED uh, by going someplace in person now. You have to do it online. In California, you can't get unemployment insurance in a brick-and-mortar building. You have to do it online, not to mention all the educational opportunities, you know, lifelong educational opportunities that are available. And as you mentioned, why require a child just because their household has limited income to do a paper on a cell phone. I mean, I know kids do this now, but think about going through your entire matriculating through 12 years of school, having to write on a cell phone. You can't save documents. It's extremely, you have to erase everything to go back and edit something else. I mean, it's worse than a typewriter, frankly. Um, Do you hear folks actually advancing cell phones as as a substitute for having a physical desktop or laptop? computer? What I hear people saying is everybody has a cell phone. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Wow. So the question really is, are they thinking? I, I, you know, it's hard to imagine. I was in a meeting with some representatives of a local government not too long ago um, where we were talking to them about different educational programs that we a sponsor. There's a program called School to Home that we sponsor providing teachers and parents with training on devices. It's a small district with a large population, a very poor household. They were saying, well, we've done surveys, they have cell phones. So, you know, you do get that. And it's people's initial reaction when you talk about providing a government subsidy for a new program. And I understand people want their dollars used well. I want my tax dollars used efficiently. And so I think some of the reforms the FCC put in place in 2012, we know, for instance, that the subscription level on the wireless phones has come down, that they've saved over $200 million from some of these reforms. So I think that they have taken some very good steps to cut out waste, fraud, and abuse. I think that they are looking at a final step that will really be important that will make sure that when people are disconnected that the program administration knows right away so that it isn't overpaying, I guess you would say, or paying for a customer that's not there. And that will get rid of that gap in time. There is so much because internet exists 
that the program can be efficient. They're talking about when you apply for other subsidy programs, whether it's food stamps or the earned income tax credit or health insurance, that people would automatically know they would get information that they are then qualified for the lifeline subsidy. And they can verify now just through querying other federal databases, you know, so the application process can be streamlined. So these are efficiencies that are, I think, important and all enabled because of broadband. And we need to make sure that those who have fewer opportunities because of income have the opportunity to really move into the digital world and take advantage of all the opportunities to learn so they're not just consumers, right? That they can learn from the internet, they could do businesses on the internet, everything that the rest of us are doing needs to be available, for, not only for children coming up, but for adults. So now you touched briefly on pricing, and I want to kind of put that mm-hmm, under the mm-hmm. under the magnifying glass for a sec. We see, you know, even the slower broadband speeds in San Francisco, folks paying ninety nine dollars per month, seventy dollars in New York, in DC it's sixty eight dollars according to a New America study. But in London, the same speeds are available for thirty eight dollars, in Paris thirty five dollars, fifteen dollars in Seoul. What are your thoughts on pricing overall, Susan? Cost is an issue for everybody. As you've just stated, there are lots of places in the world where the internet is cheaper and they have excellent service, higher speed. Lifeline is set up, as you know, to make whatever the cost is lower for low-income households. The FCC is currently talking about the $9.25 to help subsidize it. And that you know, certainly I know appreciated by uh, folks who live in low-income households, but, you know, we think that it would be worth looking at if that's the right amount. And so hopefully the FCC will entertain that after this proceeding when they include broadband as part of Lifeline. The other thing that's important, uh, two points really, in terms of cost, for a lifeline for broadband service is that at Internet for All now, we believe that there should be a payment that the consumer also makes. And we are advocating for a $10 payment. There's been some discussion of a $5 payment, you know, or a little more than 10 We think it's important for people to pay something for the internet service at home to help keep the program sustainable. And we know for telephone lifeline service that people pay something now for that. And since it's only going to be one subsidy per household, then the thought was they would contribute what they're paying now to broadband. The other piece about cost that's important is that the FCC needs to also authorize states to set up their own lifeline program. In California, there is a law in the books that says unless stipulated by the FCC, California doesn't have jurisdiction over the prices for broadband. And so we're not advocating, or what we're advocating is for the FCC to authorize states to set up you know, a specific state-level broadband program. Many states have a state lifeline program for cell phones, for telephones as well. And so this would provide some additional subsidy to low-income households, and that thus would make it truly more affordable. In California, it's about $11 additional subsidy that is contributed. The other piece is that We know that if the FCC just puts the program in place and there is no effort to communicate that this is available or, you know, to educate low-income households about this, then people won't know. And we're talking about households who generally, I think, know this is important, but the total cost of ownership isn't just the broadband. Right, We know that people don't think about broadband unless they have a computer. 
and unless they know something about operating the computer. So between the FCC and between states, you know, there needs to be some funding that helps people get low cost, perhaps refurbished computers, that helps people understand some basic digital literacy skills. And we think the FCC has the opportunity through E-rate and its support of libraries, right, to encourage libraries to raise the profile on digital literacy training that they offer and to be able to offer maybe there's a way to offer computers to low-income households through the library. So those are a couple of points that I know we differ on from some of the other consumer organizations who are out there doing a great job advocating for Lifeline. Um, Internetforallnow.org is where you can find more detail on our positions. And again, we do believe people should contribute and that there should be states should be able to participate. So there's more opportunity for digital literacy and for outreach and education to low-income communities so they can participate in broadband. It's not just because you have to learn a new behavior, a new skill. A cell phone isn't that hard to learn in terms of its basic usage. But when it comes to a computer, that's a different animal. And we know people won't think about broadband until they're able to get a computer and have some basic skills. Susan, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I just have a few final questions and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Sounds great. All right. This podcast focuses on policy, but also the people behind the policies and what makes successful people tick. So I'd like to find out from you, Susan, what do you see as best practices? And they can be apps, habits, daily routines. What keeps you on top of your game? Probably one of the most important things for me is that I'm a Buddhist and I practice every day. We chant in the mornings, chant in the evenings, uh, and that helps me stay focused and calm and uh, hopefully bring more wisdom uh, to situations uh, than I would otherwise. You know, I have to do more meditating myself. It's something that I've really been wanting to do more of. And one person I've been following who's actually based here in the Washington, D.C. area is Tara Brock. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but uh, one of my goals is to have Tara on the show. If we can make some connection between tech Mm -hmm. policy and meditation, (laughs) I'm going to figure it out. So. But, well, that's probably a, a great idea. You might want to have a couple of folks on the show. Just we spend so much time with our technology. It really is. And so much time doing so many things, right? We're so busy. Um, meditation creates a space, I think, that's important, um, not only for just sort of momentary focus or rejuvenation, but long term, just for happiness, the I'm part of the Soka Gakkai, which is also there in D.C., and I'm sure they'd love to talk with you and Tara. Well, we're going to have to figure that out. So now what's a game-changing book for you, Susan, that you find yourself recommending to everyone you meet? Hmm. Well, the last book that I read that I really talked to people about is called The Good Luck Bird by James McBride. Uh, and perhaps you've heard of it. It's it's quite a, a different story about uh, slavery and the beginning of the Civil War. And what's different about it, I think, although it's dark humor, um, the author brings a tremendous amount of humor to the story and tells it in really an amazingly creative way. Um, it's the, the the voice of the story is through uh, a young child. He, he's basically from 10 to 16 in the book. And he starts out as a young boy, but he ends up becoming a young girl to, for, because of circumstances in a way that he thinks, you know, will of course save, save his life. Uh, but he ends up, thinking that's a momentary thing and gets into a situation where he has to uh, continue that, um, that um, MO, if you will, in order to survive. And so it makes it very, uh, it, it makes the whole story in that whole period of history 
more accessible both for the voice he chooses and the humor he uses. And of course, it's just fascinating insight into human behavior as well as our history. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again for joining me, Susan. And before we close, do you have any final thoughts for the audience and where can we find you online? Okay, so online you can find me on Twitter at CETF Susan. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. So it, it, that one will be Susan Walters. And then last words, I think I would just close with one of the things that we try and help policymakers and staff really understand is that, this, especially at the FCC right now, it's an incredible opportunity that they have just with the five votes to make a huge difference for lives going forward. And, you know, as an example, in Los Angeles, there are 700,000 kids in the LA Unified School District, 88% of them on their free and reduced lunch program. We need, absolutely need to focus on households with low income because since the recession, the number of poor people has really increased in this country with the sort of the good news of the tech boom. Yes, there's lots of money being made, but it also means the gap between the rich and the poor is wider. And so when you are poor today in this country, you aren't just looking really at a gap, you're looking at a gulf or what we describe as the wall of poverty. Yes, multiple generations, but it's, you know, where is the path out of poverty today? If you're not online, you know, it's not there. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate everybody checking out our message at internetforallnow.org and consider, you know, writing into the FCC, talking about how important the Internet is for everybody. And they can asking them to do their bit to help enable all of us to be connected. You've been listening to Susan Walter, Senior Vice President for the California Emerging Technology Fund. Susan, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. That concludes Episode 29 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I cannot do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast or even if you've been listening for a while, I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Data Points newsletter, which is a summary of relevant communications and media-related research that's been done recently, as well as related socioeconomic research. You can find the sign-up for that at the top of the page at washingtech.com. Thanks again to all of you for listening, and I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 